Austin is here, and I personally think Sarah is a wonderful, awesome person. And uh, she's a, a transgender woman. She's an atheist, an LGBTQ rights activist, a community organizer. Incredible things are happening in Polk County. It's really tremendous. Uh, a podcaster. She's actually everything that you could ever want in Polk County taking care of state church separation. But um, I think many of you will get why it's a big deal after she's spoken. Um, she's a former talk uh, radio producer. She and her wife, Becca, host a weekly live podcast called Sarah Talk. Um, you should be signing up right now on your phones. You can pull them out quietly. Um, she's a volunteer audio engineer for the Recovering From Religion podcast. Sarah and Becca founded the Atheist Community of Polk County to foster community and provide educational and volunteer opportunities. And together they're raising their children with an emphasis on critical thinking and skepticism, as all parents should. Um, her talk today is a deep dive into the playbook of Project Blitz. So help me welcome Sarah Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a recovering Christian. <laughs> And uh, hey, thanks for not only giving up the beautiful weather to, to come inside and, and be here, but uh, thanks for giving up the opportunity to go to the American Atheist Convention and, uh, and just for you. Just for me. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk today about the legislative effort of Project Blitz, which is, uh, I'm sure some of you have, have heard at least a little bit about it. Um, this is a pretty academic deep dive into all of the things that these folks are trying to do and who they are. Um, so before we get into that, uh, the comedy portion of my routine and, uh, <laughs> and a, a little bit about my life story, just to give you an idea of kind of where I come from and why this stuff is important to me. So I was born in 1979 in a log cabin in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. Wow. <laughs> well, not in the log cabin, right? But uh, the day before my mother went into labor, she was nailing down deck boards on the wraparound porch outside of the, the cabin. And we lived in the garage while the house was being built. This was in a small town uh, about five miles outside of Bethany, Illinois, which no one has ever heard of. It's right about here, three and a half hours south of Chicago, a couple hours from St. Louis, uh, in the middle of corn fields and soybean fields. Nothing to do. Uh, we had a horse and goats and chickens and uh, rabbits, and I had a big furry English sheepdog that we sheared down every spring. We had a, uh, I had a pet turkey, and the pet turkey's name was Job, and I have a really great story about Job that I can't tell you because I had to cut it for time. So if you want to hear that later, <laughs> let me know. Little, little tease. So when I was seven, we moved to town, right? Bethany, Illinois is a town of about 1,500 people, a uh, small Midwest town. I had a high school graduating class of 32. There were no chain stores. The nearest town worth driving to is about 35, 40 minutes away. Uh, this is downtown, two whole blocks with its uh, historic sort of brick buildings. And we had a local diner and a locally owned video rental place, a uh, farm insurance agency, and across the street there, the bank. And it was a time and place where nobody locked their doors and we could ride our bikes all over town without anybody worrying that we'd get hit or stolen and disappear into the woods, right? But it was also corn, soybeans, and why should I have to press one for English? We live in America, white people, as far as the eye could see. No diversity at all. Um, and I like to say Bethany, Illinois, eight churches, zero stoplights. No stoplights. We had, we had a one four-way stop, right, with a flashing red light all the time. <laughs> but eight churches. And when I used to tell this story, I said nine churches, but one of them closed down. And I think it was a bed and breakfast for a while and then kind of like an antique knickknack shop. And it's for sale again now in case you're interested in owning a church from 1916, a five bed, four bath, single family home with attached sanctuary, all yours for the reasonable asking price of $40,000. We had a Methodist church, a Baptist church, Presbyterian church, Everybody went to church, and my family went to the First Christian Church of Bethany, Illinois, where in Sunday school, mostly I learned to tear out the little stamps of Bible figures, and you'd lick them and stick them in your workbook, right? My elementary school music teacher was the uh, kid's music teacher at our church. 
Uh, my granny tended the nursery, and I think my dad was even a deacon for a time. But looking back, we didn't really take it all too seriously. We were in church on Sunday mornings, and we prayed before the important meals on the holidays. But I think that lack of seriousness was, uh, forgive the pun, a blessing. They didn't spend a lot of time outside of church talking about God or their beliefs. Um, and I'm not really sure they're even strong Christians today. It's just really not something that we talk about. But for a short time, I really got into it. And this is probably the earliest memory I have of my activist -y tendencies, and it foreshadows uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about with Project Blitz. I started a Bible study group at my school, and I organized one year a Meet Me at the Poll. Yes, I was one of those. Wow, look how excited I was there. Bibleopoly, the, the religious ripoff of Monopoly. I actually asked for that as a gift, if you can believe it. So I had a fancy study Bible, and I had given a couple of talks or sermons uh, at a, the local church. And, um, and I used this, this fancy Bible to put together our talks and our discussions in this, in this school church, or the school religious group. But even then, as a young student in the mid-90s, I knew that there were legal implications. So I researched and studied and became what I thought was an expert on my rights as a Christian student. And I probably got that information from a resource, something like this one. This is from the website of the organization uh, that we'll be talking about today, uh, the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation. On their website, a section called Freedom of Religious Expression in Public Schools. I knew that, for example, while our small school didn't have a lot of clubs, uh, if they gave something to the math club or the chess club, they had to give it to us too. I knew that it had to be student organized and student led, um, if we, other than getting permission to use a classroom and no faculty could be involved. And we met during lunch in, of all unlikely places, the biology lab. The biology lab where we learned biology from our very Christian biology teacher. Uh, number eight here on their list is the uh, student religious groups get to have everything everybody else does. Now it was around this time that I started feeling a little different in other ways too. Uh, puberty was doing things to my body that I didn't really understand and not necessarily in the way that a normal boy was feeling about these changes and I became obsessed with uh, what it would be like to be a girl. Why wasn't I a girl? How cool would it be if I could just wake up tomorrow and be a girl and everything just made sense? And you know, words like transgender didn't exist back then. My people were jokes on the Jerry Springer show. I didn't know my wife was a man. And so without having any community, without having any resources, I tucked everything, put it in the closet, and, and stayed that way. And I learned very quickly that being different in this way was very, very bad. Well, eventually I had a nervous breakdown in the hallway at school, and I was diagnosed with ADHD and clinical depression, and my, my grades were awful, and they took me out of public school and hired a teacher to come homeschool me. And then I moved out into my own place, and I could finally start exploring femininity, at least still in private, right? I couldn't still be very public about it. But I'd also stopped going to church. I drank a lot, I smoked a carton of cigarettes a week, and I had a lot of sex with a lot of people. I became worldly. Well, while I was supposed to be going to college, that's another story for another time, I got involved with a local radio station in Decatur, Illinois, where I took a part-time job uh, and quickly moved up to the producer of the Byers & Company Morning Show on News Talk 1340 WSOY AM Decatur. <laughs> and we were the number one morning show in the central Illinois market year over year over year. And after our show, we had a classic conservative talk radio lineup. We had Rush Limbaugh and G. Gordon Liddy and Dr. Laura Schlesinger and Sean Hannity and Mike Gallagher. And of course, on Sunday mornings, we ran Christian programming. And I ended up back in church, this time at Church of God, for a girl, usually a girl. And this place was like any kind of church I had ever been to. My hometown church was a sit down, be quiet, till it's time to stand up and sing kind of place. And the Church of God is a hands in the air and shout if the Spirit moves you kind of place. 
and it was culture shock, but they had a praise band, and I played guitar, and it wasn't long before I was playing guitar in the praise band, and then it wasn't long after that that I really started questioning a lot of these beliefs, thanks, oddly, to the youth pastor. I was doing a private one-on-one -on -one Bible study with this youth pastor, and he had me going through chapter by chapter, writing down all the truths and the promises. Well, of course, the saying goes, the great way to make an atheist is to actually read the Bible, and I read it, <laughs> cover to cover, and I was shocked at some of the things I had never heard from the pulpit. And the more I read, the less I believed. So I eventually left this church, too, and this was the last church I ever attended. And then I came to Central, Illinois, uh, Central Florida 12 years ago, and that's when I really was kind of able to open up. This area is uh, fantastic in its diversity, and I met people who were different than me, and I started discarding some of those old conservative religious ideas, and finally came out and was able to transition and, and do all of these great things. And we started the podcast in 2015, Sarah Talk, to talk about my gender transition. How was work going to receive this new information and handle all of the steps of the transition. What were my coworkers gonna say? And then North Carolina passed House Bill 2, which was the bill that remanded all restroom users to only use the restroom, which matched their gender as marked at birth. And then Texas tried to put theirs through shortly after that, and suddenly our show was not a soft, fluffy, let me tell you about my life show, we were political and activisty, So that's kind of where we are now. And then, while I was doing the show, when we got into this stuff, it was then that I realized very seriously, whenever there's an attack on the queer community, on our basic rights to exist in a free society, it's almost always coming from someone wearing a MAGA hat, someone holding a Bible, or more often, both. Thank you, Papa Pence. <laughs> and so I found my activism standing at the intersection of the queer and atheist communities. And then we can talk about this uh, at, in the after party here, but uh, then I took that sort of rural upbringing and not having community, uh, and that led into the creation of the atheist community of Polk County, seeing a need uh, room between the Orlando groups and the Tampa groups, and we're kind of stuck in the middle with a long drive to get to either of y'all, and wouldn't it be great if we had some things that, that were a little more local that, that we could do, and then partner with these groups to get things done in Central Florida. All right, so I think that's enough old home movies, but hopefully that helps frame the perspective that I uh, bring to these issues. So now the academic portion. I hope you're taking notes. Project Blitz is the backbone of the religious rights efforts to install Christian dominionism in the United States under the guise of religious liberty. A change of decor is in order. There we go. Much better. Christian States of America. So the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation Incorporated was established in 2005 to work alongside members of the Congressional Prayer Caucus in order to build a network of like-minded government leaders who are committed to prayer and action. And their stated purpose and mission for Project Blitz is to protect the free exercise of traditional Judeo-Christian values and beliefs, reclaim and properly frame the narrative to see public discourse understood and defined on their terms, to reclaim and properly frame the narrative and language of religious liberty issues. So the emphasis here is mine, but see how obvious this is about rewriting the narrative and the definition of religious liberty through this state legislation that they've been pushing all over the place. So to put it into perspective a little bit, uh, Protect Thy Neighbor is a project of Americans United for the separation of church and state, and they documented 86 bills filed in state legislatures across the country in 2015. Most of them right out of this playbook. Uh, the most common ones would allow discrimination against LGBTQ people, and deny access to reproductive health care rights. Let's jump from 2015 to 2018. Now the total number of bills has swelled to 370. Yes, I took the time to copy and paste all of those little crosses into that map. 
Well, thankfully, many of these didn't pass, but the ones that did are definitely clearing the path for others. And by mid-January of this year, six states already had Project Blitz legislation introduced. In God We Trust bills have already been filed in Alaska, Kentucky, Missouri, and South Carolina. Georgia is expected to try passing a state RIFRA. Uh, right now in Texas, there are 14 bills in committee that go all the way from In God We Trust and Ten Commandments monuments to religious refusals and exemptions. Does everybody know this woman? This is Apostle Kimberly Daniels, who runs a side hustle ministry where demonic possession, exorcism, prosperity gospel, and claims of personal revelations and prophecy from God are normal. Kimberly Daniels, who said in 2008, quote, I thank God for slavery. If it wasn't for slavery, I might be somewhere in Africa worshiping a tree, end quote. Democratic State House Representative for House District 14, Kim Daniels, who in the wake of tragedy used the Parkland school shooting to advance a bill that she had filed, which would require the national motto, In God We Trust, be displayed in all of our schools. Now, you know that bill passed with overwhelming support and went into effect last year. That bill comes right out of the pages of Project Blitz. She filed House Bill 303, which passed in 2017, that bans school districts from discriminating against students, parents, and school personnel on the basis of religious viewpoint or expression. That is also a Project Blitz bill. Now, put a pin in our friend Kim Daniels. We'll come back in a minute. So the Christian nationalist movement, as Lucian mentioned, is well-organized, well-funded operation. This is data taken from the, the foundation's uh, public Form 990 filings. Uh, and it shows an annual, uh, average annual revenue of about $1.9 million. Uh, and they're spending every penny, as you can see. And of course, their mission is supported indirectly from other organizations who are, have ac exponentially higher revenues, like the Liberty Council, Beckett Fund, Family Research Council, the ACLJ, and topping the charts, the Alliance Defending Freedom, whose recent revenues exceed $50 million. And that's not to say that money is everything, but it does indicate how well organized these efforts are. They are highly invested. So the third annual Religious Freedom Measures Impacting Prayer and Faith in America report, they need to hire somebody from Disney to acronym. This is too much. <laughs> they updated it in January for 2019, and uh, it's a 148-page document that they crafted to give to state legislators that details the goals of Project Blitz. It includes cherry-picked studies, outright false claims, model legislation that our folks like Kim Daniels can just rip from the playbook and file on the floor. And they offer resources, including lawyers trained in constitutional law who can help write this language and then defend it when it gets challenged. And let me add a disclaimer here. Uh, I'm, I'm just a concerned citizen, right? I'm not a legal expert, but you don't have to be. This document is written in a language that's very plain, uh, very easy for the layperson to understand. But don't take legal advice from a PowerPoint presentation. So let's take a deep dive here and break this down. This is divided into three main categories of religious liberty measures, starting with legislation regarding our country's religious heritage. And I promise I will try to Reader's Digest this and make it a little less boring than it actually is to read all 148 pages, but I highly recommend you do it if you're interested. So these are all model legislations designed for state lawmakers to easily draw up and file. We have the National Motto Display Act. That's the one Kim Daniels pushed through the Florida legislature requiring the display of In God We Trust in classrooms. State lawmakers across the country have found this model legislation on their desks tweaked it for their own state, and now seven states, including Arkansas, Tennessee, and Florida, have all passed some version of this, and uh, there are other states obviously considering it this year as well. The National Motto License Plate Act, this one's fun, this would require states to offer special In God We Trust license plate designs. Now legislation to permit car, car owners to have a In God We Trust license plate is already in most states, but their hope here is that by encouraging this, these license plates will serve as moving billboards. 
In February, the Secular Coalition of Arizona re revealed that $17 from each one of their In God We Trust license plates was going to Alliance Defending Freedom, who you'll recall has revenues that make Uncle Scrooge's money bin look like chump change. The next two sort of go hand in hand. They're promoting historical documents related to the nation's founding, like the Federalist Papers, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, even the Mayflower Compact and the Northwest Ordinance. So the Civic Literacy Act would require high school students to study these documents as a graduation requirement and encourages teachers to read or post excerpts from these documents. The Religion and Legal History Act provides for public displays of these documents in state buildings. Seems harmless enough, right? Well, they conveniently pro provide some examples for us, like the Mayflower Compact that says, quote, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, and so on and so on. And Washington's farewell address, also on their list, Washington says, and let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that a national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Let's hang that in every state house. <coughs> Yes, maybe relevant to the study of history, but it's easy to see, again, what the narrative is. This is always meant to be a Christian nation. And for bills like these, their messaging is, this is just about history, so they expect them to pass pretty easily. And finally, the Bible Literacy Act. Now, this is exactly what it sounds like. They suggest that states require schools to offer elective classes on the Bible, Old and New Testaments, to grades 9 and above, with the purpose of teaching students a knowledge of biblical content, characters, poetry, and narratives that are prerequisites to understanding contemporary society and culture. Citation needed. This bill wouldn't prohibit schools from having classes studying other holy texts or religions, but the Christian one would be the law. How can this not be seen as preferencing one religion over all others and none? Well, currently, Bible classes are taught in public schools in seven states, all in the South, of course. And back we go to our friend, Democratic representative and self-described demon buster, Kimberly Daniels. This photo is a screen grab from one of her YouTube videos where she's speaking in tongues to a packed crowd. Well, in January of this year, she filed the Bible Literacy Act here in Florida, too. Now, here's the text of Daniels' bill. Listen for the similarity. The school district board shall install in the public schools in the district a secular program of education including but not limited to an objective study of religion, an objective study of the Bible including but not limited to, a course on the Hebrew scriptures and Old Testament of the Bible, and a course on the New Testament of the Bible. A course offered pursuant to this section must be offered as an elective course for students in grades 9 through 12. Copy, paste. What does objective study mean? Secular program? Whose translation and interpretation are we going to use? How can you be objective toward religion and the Bible when the basic tenets of Scripture are disputed by between some estimates around 30,000 different denominations? And in places where these classes already exist, there's research showing that they're not actually being taught very objectively. This is my surprised face. <laughs> Now, feel free to disagree with me. I, I host a, a talk show. People disagree with a lot of the things I think and say. But make this class a comparative study of world religions. I'll take that class. I'd love for my kid to have that class. Let's study the religion of the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians alongside the Bible. Let's learn about Islam and Hinduism. Study the things in the Bible that are pretty clearly stolen right from the glyphs of more ancient beliefs, right? Virgin birth, December 25th, the winter solstice, great flood myths, sun gods, these are not unique to Christianity. And like actually reading the Bible in the right environment might bring a person to question those beliefs in an objective 
uh, way, so too might a class like that. Put that class in my kid's high school elective list and I'll sign on to it. No problem. Bible class? No thanks. Now when I engage with people on this one, and I'll spend a little extra time on this one because uh, it, it's happening right here right now. And when I engage with people on this, I hear a lot of, well, it's an elective. They're not making your kid go. You can choose to take the class. So put on your skeptic hats. Is this a well-reasoned response? What could possibly go wrong with an elective Bible class? While the model legislation is designed at high schools, other public schools around the country are already offering classes like this at much earlier grades. In December of 2018, Elizabeth Deal of West, West Virginia had a lawsuit go to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals after her case was dismissed by a lower court. She says in first grade, her daughter and another girl who were not enrolled in that Bible class were put in a coat closet and given an iPad to entertain themselves by the teacher and the preacher who were teaching the class. In third grade, the bullying started. Deal said, the kids started telling her that she and her family were all going to hell. One girl saw the Harry Potter book she was reading, slammed it down on her desk yelling, you don't need to be reading this witch magic stuff, you should be reading the Bible. <laughs> well, the problem, of course, with you know, a course being elective like this, is, especially in heavily Christian areas, is that the one or two kids who don't take it get singled out. And did you catch that they had a preacher helping teach that class? Mm-hmm. So take the very likely possibility of harassment and bullying of kids who don't take the class. Put that aside. Even as an elective, you're still allocating public taxpayer funds to a religious purpose, regardless of how objective and secular you try to say that it will be. Americans United reports that 14 of these bills have been filed in 11 states already this year alone. <clears throat> Now that's just category one. Display in God we trust everywhere. Display and teach specific documents from our history that demonstrate a religious influence in some way and straight up teach the Bible in our public schools. Now where category one is initiatives and bills filed to be in the state legislatures and are expected to meet very little resistance, category two is more about proclamations and resolutions. So keep in the back of your mind, right? These are expressions of legislative intent, not laws themselves. We have a proclamation recognizing Religious Freedom Day. This is basically a state level version of the National Religious Freedom Day proclamation. Uh, and again, all about bending the narrative using cherry picked quotes from the founders and others. Now, do you think that this mentions the non-religious, those of no faith, one small blip at the end of this two-page proclamation, almost as an afterthought. We have a proclamation recognizing Christian Heritage Week when one day just isn't enough. Let's celebrate all week long. <laughs> this one also includes a number of quotes from historical figures like Franklin, Jefferson, and Madison. And it starts, religious faith was not only important in official American life during the periods of discovery, exploration, colonization, and growth, but religious faith also has been acknowledged and incorporated into all three branches of American federal government from their very beginning. Citation needed. Why, even the first act of America's first Congress in 1774 was to ask a minister to open in prayer and to lead Congress in reading four chapters of the Bible. And you thought watching legislative sessions on the Florida Channel could be boring. We have a proclamation recognizing the importance of the Bible in history, where the first two spin the story that our founders' belief in God informed all of their decisions in constructing our government. This one will try to convince you that the Bible itself was foundational to our government too. They say, Gutenberg chose the Bible to be the first book off his new printing press invention. The Bible has been translated into 3,223 languages. Surveys report that 9 out of 10 Americans have Bibles in their home. Show of hands, who has a Bible at their house? Yeah. In my angry atheist phase, I kind of threw out all of my Bibles, but we still have two uh, happily provided to us by the 
uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. My wife is a former Jehovah's Witness. And we have two versions of their Bible, uh, which have complete sections and verses missing from the new version that were in the old version because the old guys in New York had some new light from God and did a little editing. But we keep Bibles in our house not because we believe. We use them to demonstrate the nonsense and show the inconsistencies. So out of that 9 out of 10, how many of those people even believe or read them? Well, we know that's not very many. Never mind the facts. And they cite our earliest public education law in America. This is fun. 1642. Quote, It being the chief project of that old deluder Satan to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures, as in former times, it is therefore ordered that after the Lord hath increased the settlement to the number of 50 householders, they shall then forthwith appoint one within their town to teach all children to read and write. So there you go. Schools were expressly created so that people could read to read the Bible. We did take God out of their schools. <laughs> and finally, a proclamation recognizing Christmas Day. Are you shitting me? It's already a holiday. Okay? And this one's kind of short, so I'll read through it real quick. And again, right, imagine this is your governor standing at the podium reading this proclamation. Christmas is the Christian feast that celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ as the Savior of all throughout the world. Traditionally, families throughout our great state gather together during Christmas holidays, enjoying many customs, including choosing a Christmas tree, participating in Christmas pageants, singing and playing Christmas carols and exchanging gifts, those are pagan traditions. <laughs> Advent and Christmas traditions and symbols prevail throughout the holiday season, and by their presence they bring to mind dearly held Christian values and beliefs, including that in Jesus Christ all people are saved from sin and promised everlasting life. The celebration of Christmas reminds men, women, and children across our state of the lessons Christ taught and exemplified, such as the importance of caring for others, except the bad hombres, giving sacrificially, to the border wall go fund me and sharing with those in need in our neighborhoods churches schools and communities those lazy people on welfare okay I may be ad-libbing a bit but the hypocrisy is there now while families and friends in this state gather this December to share meals words of encouragement and gifts it is important to remember the deeper meaning of Christmas and Christ's life-changing message of God's love and his promise of salvation for all people who will trust in him now therefore I, Governor Sarah Austin, do hereby recognize December 25th, 2019 as Christmas Day in this state, and I call this observance to the attention of all of our citizens. There's three minutes of our lives we will never get back. <laughs> so again, Category 2 is all about state-level proclamations, which send the message, again, rewriting the narrative. Now, Category 3 is a little bit more complicated, these come under the heading of religious liberty protections, and they're further divided into three subcategories. So I'm really going to try to rip, zip through these. Under public, uh, public policy resolutions, now the first three I uh, would group together, they are just blatant assaults on the LGBTQ community. We have a resolution establishing public policy favoring intimate sexual relations only between married heterosexual couples. Again, we need some acronyms. A resolution establishing public policy favoring reliance on and maintenance of birth gender. My turn. A resolution establishing public policy favoring adoption by intact heterosexual marriage-based families. Well, when equality is under attack, atheists have to show up, and they make a veiled attempt. Thank you. They make a veiled attempt here to hide their religious bigotry behind garbage science, like... The science concerning same-sex attraction and behavior is not settled, while the consequences associated with such behavior are well understood. And they argue that the state has a compelling interest in preferring same-sex marriages, Supreme Court ruling notwithstanding. Uh, I, I'm trying real hard to stay political here, but the Republican National Party platform includes a section called Defending Marriage Against an Activist Judiciary. It condemns the Obergefell ruling. 
and it states that traditional marriage and family based on marriage between one man and one woman is the foundation for a free society and has for millennia been entrusted with the rearing children and in instilling Christian values. They also argue, available scientific evidence does not support the assertion that gender identity is an innate fixed property of human beings independent of biological sex. And most children who experience cross-gender identification do not continue to do so into adolescence or adulthood. Now this is outright false. First, Science is showing more and more that gender is a spectrum and that the binary is a social construct. Second, we haven't really studied transgender youth into adulthood in any large enough sample size to start making claims like this. But anecdotally, the examples we do have show the opposite. They say members of the transgender population are significantly higher risk of a variety of mental health problems compared to the members of the non-transgender population. Well, sure, maybe I wouldn't have the mental health problems I have if you didn't tell me all the time that I'm going to go to hell and can't use a restroom and I have to pay all this money and jump through all these hoops just to get my driver's license and my birth certificate updated. They point out our high rates of suicide and self-harm reported by my community, and they're not wrong. How much of that is brought on by the mistreatment we receive often from the faith community? They try to spin this as a disease of the mind that should be treated as a psychological problem. We have a resolution establishing public policy favoring adoption by intact heterosexual marriage-based families. Of course, this is the precursor to bills that would allow adoption and foster placement agencies to play the religious freedom card and deny gay couples in adoption. Here they make the argument this is in the best interest of children to be in a stable family environment, which of course gay people can never provide. Ten states currently have laws on the books allowing religious-based discrimination by child welfare agencies. And finally, the resolution condemning religious persecution worldwide. This is super weird. This is just a list of examples from around the world where Christians face persecution. Ah, the persecution complex. Yes, Christians do experience persecution in the Middle East, for example. And that's wrong. But for a state governor or legislative body to pass a resolution decrying this sort of treatment in another country seems just a little out of scope to me. Now watch how all of this resolution stuff turns into legislation. Here we have protection for professionals and individuals. These deal with the protection of free exercise of religion as defined in speech and actions, wearing religious symbols refusal to participate in certain actions, like uh, refer refusal to cover abortion in healthcare, refusal to host a same-sex wedding. This is your classic religious exemption to discriminate card. The Marriage Tolerance Act, better known to you probably as the First Amendment Defense Act, now rebranded. Preserving Religious Freedom Act, nothing new to hear to see either. This is the old Religious Freedom Restoration Act or the state RIFRA. Again, just under a new name, uh, about protecting the free exercise right to discriminate from substantial burden imposed by the government. And then you have the Child Protection Act. Here they want to ensure that adoption and foster agencies can be free to discriminate based on religious belief under the free exercise clause. And they even say, quote, This act is not intended to limit or deny any person's right to adopt a child or participate in foster care, end quote. Except, that's exactly what it does <laughs> by allowing child placing agencies to use their sincerely held religious beliefs to refuse to adopt out to gay couples or non-Christian couples or interracial couples, or really anything that they can throw at the wall and get to stick as my deeply held religious belief. At the end of January, South Carolina's governor asked the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to issue a waiver. And they did, allowing a state-supported, faith-based foster care agency to discriminate against prospective gay foster parents and even non-Christians after a Jewish woman was rejected by the group. And what infuriates me the most about these, the perception, at least, perception is reality, you would rather a child be homeless, you would rather a child maybe even age out of the system, 
rather than being placed in a capable, loving, gay, or non-Christian family, that disgusts me. And you don't get to call yourself pro-life. The Clergy Protection Act, uh, this is about protecting clergy and religious organizations for honoring their sincerely held belief relating to participation in a lawful marriage. As for religious organizations, this is the Burwell v. Hobby Lobby poor decision by the courts that said businesses can have religious beliefs somehow, and they cite bakers and florists who <laughs> used their religious freedom card and then lost their businesses in the resulting court uh, battles and public response. Then we have the Licensed Professional Civil Rights Act. This is the same sort of idea here, but this implies to anyone who has a state license required for their job. So the problem they argue here is that professionals are being censured or deprived of their chosen livelihoods, not because of poor service to their clients, but because of disagreements with or disapproval of their sincerely held religious beliefs. This, they say, is hostile to religious belief. Of course, never addressing the hostility of the religious belief itself. And finally, we're getting there. Category 3C is protection for teachers and students. We have the Student Prayer Certification Act. This is useless legislation was codified in uh, 20 U.S.C. 7904 by the U.S. Congress that requires public elementary and secondary schools to certify annually that they do not have a policy that prevents or otherwise denies participation in constitutionally protected prayers. Did you know this was a thing? I sure didn't. Federal law right now requires schools to submit annually in writing to the education agency that they do not have a policy preventing constitutionally protected prayer. So the Federal Department of Education can even withhold funding from public schools who do not comply with this reporting component. So what this does is it copies down that federal requirement into the state law and also requires that the state education agency send out a reminder letter. It's time to update your records and re remind us that you don't have a policy that discriminates against prayer. If you ever wondered where your tax dollars were going. So then you have the Teacher Protection Act. This is a remedy for a school district teacher, board member, or other employee that might be sued regarding constitutionally protected religious expression. And under this act, they can request assistance from the Attorney General in defending them. They argue that teachers and administrators are just so confused by inconsistent federal court rulings and so fearful of lawsuits that sometimes they might make the wrong decision and stifle the freedom of expression, even if they were acting in good faith. Or that when they do allow that expression, Andrew Seidel over at the Freedom From Religion Foundation is furiously banging away angry letters on an old typewriter. <laughs> and finally, Preserving Religious Freedom in School Act. Uh, this really just reinforces what's already protected. School districts can't discriminate on the basis of viewpoint or expression. Students can express belief in coursework, artwork. This is the stuff I researched in junior high in the 90s and knew to be my rights then. And this act wouldn't change that, but it would specifically provide that teachers and coaches, for example, could participate in student-initiated prayer, despite plenty of court rulings that find that even bowing your head during a student-led prayer could be seen as endorsing the act or the religion, especially considering the authoritative position that teachers and administrators have over students. So that's the three main sections of bills and resolutions. Is anyone interested in pursuing a career in constitutional law now? <laughs> well, if you look under your seat, there's about a 50 question test. Let's see if you've been paying attention. I'm kidding, of course, but I, this is a ton to take in. I know that. So in light of all of this, Here's your comforting message. I find some comfort in the fact that polling continues to show that these views do not represent the majority of Americans. If only our government were representative of the actual diversity of Americans. And over the recent years, the number of people who identify as religious, attend religious services, or find religion meaningful in their lives is dropping fast. 
Recent general social survey data showed that the religious nuns are now the largest religious demographic in the U.S., slightly larger than Catholics and evangelicals. And research continues to show that our younger generations are less religious than any generation before. And those lazy millennials who take everything for granted and don't want to work a hard day's work, well, they're actually out organizing marches and challenging politicians and running for office themselves, and they're winning. We can debate the finer points of gun control, but in the days and hours and days and weeks after the tragic shooting in Parkland, we saw our young people show us that they do care about politics. They are engaged, and they're going to change the world. It's like the uh, protest sign that's gone viral. I'm sure you've seen it. If you build a wall, my generation will tear it down. Our young people don't deserve the claims of apathy so often hurled at them. My generation does. I didn't get involved until my 30s. But I see in our youth a new way of, of civic responsibility, compassion for those different than them, and with that, a strong sense of urgency. And don't take that the wrong way. Let's not kick us older folks out to pasture just yet, right? Everyone has an important role to play. The challenge for organizers is to match talent and expertise with the needs. And that translates even to how we consider people running for office, right? It concerns me, for example, that we have a lawmaker's job it is to write laws, regulations, and conduct investigations in the technology sector who doesn't have the first idea how cell phones, the internet, Google, or Facebook work. Ted Poe of Texas, former district attorney, county judge, and U.S. representative pictured here, during a congressional hearing last year, who asked the CEO of Google, I have an iPhone. And if I move from here and I go over there and sit on the left with my Democrat friends, it would make them real nervous. Can Google track my movement? Does Google know through this phone that I have moved here, moved over here to the left while holding up a decidedly not Google Apple iPhone product? He did not seek re-election, and I think that's a wise decision. How many of you have seen this viral tweet? Your parents in 1996 don't trust anyone on the internet. Your parents in 2016, freedomeagle.facebook says Hillary invented AIDS. Bless his heart, that's my father right there. And I love him to death, but some of the stuff he shares on Facebook. Look, I don't want freedomeagle.facebook guy writing our laws. There's some truth in comedy, right? But again, there are certainly people in all areas and all demographics with the knowledge and skills right for our cause. And we have to be good at matching skills to needs. But I do want to underscore the importance of our youth. They have many more years left in this state, in this country, on this planet than I do. The leaders of today have to be preparing to shift to a more advisory role and willingly allow ourselves, and I know this is hard, to guide our young people into taking over the reins of leadership. Are we engaging our youth now so that they'll be ready? Do we have succession planning in our groups in the movement? My generation grew up on the front edge of the new internet frontier. I connected to Prodigy on a 12-baud landline modem. We had to call long distance. And long distance was per minute. <laughs> Believe me, I've tried to keep up, but the changes and advancements in technology have outpaced me. I used to run my own business doing computer repair and website design, and I had a mail and a DNS and a web server in my house. But I'm not the expert I once was. And it boggles my mind, just this whole movement to return to the good old days. What, when queer people couldn't come out of the closet and women were supposed to be making babies and sandwiches and black folks were supposed to drink from uh, separate drinking fountains and much, much worse. These are the good old days? For some. Yes, I have fond memories of my childhood, but I'm not clamoring for a return to the 80s. This is a floppy disk. That's what they had before they had uh, CDs and DVDs. Before you could just download the file from through the air. All right, so I will always have a special place in my heart for the original Nintendo Entertainment System, I get, but you get the point. Even with all our current social challenges, generally speaking, more things are better for more people right now than they have ever been in our history. Why the hell go back? I'm looking forward. 
as a humanist, as a parent. I just want to leave my kids in a world that's better off than it was when I came into it. And in this stage of my life, turning 40 this year, I'm realizing it's becoming less about what I want in the world and more about helping them create the world they want to live in. So what the hell do we do? What role should you and I play? If you're like me, after sifting through this, I felt overwhelmed, maybe a little hopeless, definitely attacked in many ways. And then all of that passed and I realized this needs to be shouted from the rooftops to have the hot white light of science and reason shown across its pages. And I realized we need to come together, get organized, and have a plan. Sometimes it feels like we're powerless to the forces at work around us. And like most things, there's not a magic bullet that will stop Project Blitz. But I would like to share with you some of my personal goals that I've set for myself that may be helpful to you as we all try to find our place in this moment. So first, can we agree to try to avoid things that don't support these goals? Sharing memes that mock religion feels good and we probably all do it, I know I'm guilty. But constantly screaming into that echo chamber doesn't support my goals. All caps Twitter wars with anonymous users doesn't really advance my goals. There's a time and a place and a benefit for us to be able to come together and agree that gods aren't real and have a good laugh. But we have to step out of that bubble sometimes and get out from behind the keyboard and stay focused on the goals. We need to educate and empower our youth. You can't rely on schoolhouse rocks to teach your kids how government works. And if I've learned anything from my nine-year-old, it's that kids can handle topics that we think are over their heads. They really can. We take our kids to the, we took them to the March for Our Lives rally in Lakeland. We've been to the Science March in Orlando. We all go to Pride every year. We take them to vote with us in every election. Are we preparing them to be the future leaders? Are they learning leadership skills and critical thinking skills? I like to play a little street epistemology game with our, with our nine-year-old from time to time. I want to know what he's thinking, but I really want to know why. How did you get there? So I'd ask, what do you think about building a wall along the border to keep people from coming here illegally? He says, I don't think that's a good idea. Why not, I ask. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, it turns out even my nine-year-old knows that ladders and shovels and boats and airplanes exist. <laughs> now, it is a slightly more complicated issue than that, yes, but I really just wanted to get into his brain and figure out what he was thinking and why and what his reasons were and how he got to the conclusions that he got to. Ask your kids, do you think there should be a Bible class offered in your school? And let them talk through the reasons for their answer. Stay as neutral as possible. Ask questions to help them figure out if they've reasoned through that position. It's actually kind of fun. And not just with our kids. We need to have these conversations with people whose beliefs are different. Genuine, polite, in-person conversations that we go into with an agreement not to put a check mark in the win column, but to better understand each other, not to argue. Gently and respectfully challenge beliefs like the Bible should be taught in public schools. Should we teach the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu Puranas? How would you feel if the Florida legislature were considering a bill to require all public schools to have a class on the Quran? Why? How did you come to that conclusion? Be a mirror to reflect their beliefs back to them. And you'll absolutely find some pretty apathetic people too. And you can also use this to try to gently inspect why they're so apathetic. And in that conversation, they may find that they really should care. And allow your own positions to be challenged. Have I sufficiently reasoned my own position? Am I just agreeing with my tribe? Am I willing to consider new evidence and update my beliefs accordingly? Ask questions. Question everything. You may have a great idea and fall into that trap of, ah, I'm sure somebody else already thought of that. Now this almost happened to me recently when considering how we respond to this thing of Project Blitz, and I'll take you very quickly down that rabbit trail. I thought, well, I can name a bunch of things that we as individuals can do and we as community uh, groups can do. But we need advocates in the legislature who will stand up when these crazy bills get filed and say, not in here. 
I got some questions about that. That's not okay with me. Now, who the heck would that be in Florida? Well, a friend of the cause, Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith, for, for one, sure, he's uh, been on the record. He was outspoken against the In God We Trust on Our Schools bill, uh, tweeting out, let's keep a clear separation between church and state. Ana Eskamani has been challenging the Bible class bill. Who else? Now, the Congressional Free Thought Caucus was formed about a year ago uh, this month in the U.S. House and already has 10 members. What if we had a state-level Free Thought Caucus? How would that even work? How do you start that process? Who do you talk to? Would it be useful? I had a million questions. This is how my brain works. And so I reached out into the void and I said, listen, this might already be in the works. I don't know if it's even a good idea, uh, if it would even be useful, but I had this thought fall out of my brain. And within 20 minutes from across the void, the angelic voice of David Williamson responded and said, we've got good contacts for this. Let's find out. So we did, and now the gears are starting to turn. Not every idea is going to work, of course, but there are good ideas in this room. Share them. Ask the question. Vote. Vote. Vote in the primaries, the general, the midterms, national, state, and local elections. Volunteer with a candidate that you support. Go to your school board meetings. Go to your city council meetings. Call your representatives in government. Schedule a meeting with your lawmaker at their local office. Show up at town halls. Ask questions of our elected officials about their position on real religious liberty, the separation of religion and government. These are state-level initiatives in Project Flitz. And there are national organizations that are working to help us, but I think the key here is going to be local and grassroots activism. So get involved. Run for office yourself. Now, after four years of podcasting, I've got way too much damning audio out in the universe, but I've thought about running for a local office. A trans person running for office in Polk County, holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) And you may be thinking similarly, come on, Sarah, I couldn't do that. But let me remind you, and I promise this is the last time I'm going to pick on her today, we elected a demon buster exorcist to the Florida House and a giant toddler to the highest office in the land. (laughs) The political views and opinions expressed during this presentation are solely those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the Central Florida Free Thought community, its leaders, members, or affiliates. Okay, I'm just saying, (laughs) consider running for office. I think you stand a pretty good chance. And consider this, Daniels has already done a ton of damage since being elected in 2016. In 2018 election, she won her primary race by over 2,500 votes and then ran unopposed in the general. Despite investigations by an ethics commission into falsified tax filings surrounding her church properties, she sits on the House Education Committee And before she got busted for filing false financial disclosures, she sat on the Public Integrity and Ethics Committee. Who is the science, evidence, reason-based candidate going to be? Maybe you. Project Blitz targets more than just we, the secular people. We have to join forces with other communities that these initiatives marginalize. Let's form and strengthen connections between secular groups and LGBT groups and women's rights groups, and faith leaders of all stripes. Yet we need rabbis and imams and even Christian clergy who believe that this is all unnecessary overreach. People who understand the importance that separating religion and government protects them too. And they're out there. Let's call them up and set an extra seat at the table of ideas. And that can't be solely the work of organizers or the boards. These are personal connections that you may have that you can reach out to and bring into this coalition. (coughs) And support the organizations that are already primed and willing to offer resources back to us. There are a ton of organizations at every level that we can put our time, energy, and money into. Become a member. When representatives from these groups can sit down across from our elected officials and say, our organization represents X number of your constituents, or Y number of Floridians, or this percentage of Americans, And if we go to the polls and back it up, there's some currency and leverage in that. 
The organizations supporting Project Blitz have a considerable head start on us, and they have a ton of money. So we have some catching up to do. At the beginning of February, 43 organizations joined together in a statement opposing Project Blitz and similar legislative efforts. And now some of these names you'll find familiar. American Atheists, Secular Coalition for America, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, the ACLU, but also included in this coalition are groups like African American Ministers in Action, the Baptist Joint Committee on Religious Liberty, the Episcopal Church, Muslim, Presbyterian, and Methodist groups, and LGBTQ rights organizations. Finally, three years after Project Blitz first launched, there is a united opposition to these efforts. And without getting complacent, I think we can take a little comfort in that. And I'm also comforted to know that in this very room are the leaders and members and volunteers of the Central Florida Free Thought community who are already out doing great work around this, planning out how we best respond to this. Thank you. Where do I fit into that? How can you best contribute? How are we part of the solution? There will be a disagreement, I'm sure, in how to best approach this, which items should have our highest priorities and focus, but let's remember that we are far more alike than we are different. And when we bring our unique talents all together in a common cause, we find power. So I hope that this leaves you with a better understanding of the nature and scope of this effort. And I hope that you're already thinking of how your own expertise and skills and passions can be focused towards this goal of leaving the world just a little bit better than we found it by fighting for a secular government that represents and respects all people. Thank you. Here's my contact information if you'd like to get in touch. Uh, check out the Sarah Talk podcast, just not at work. Uh, and if I didn't burn too much time, if sure. you want me to take a question or two, I can do that. Not going to promise I have very good answers. Questions are great. Um, I'm going to bring the microphone around, and I'm going to take the microphone back after you ask the question. <laughs> and I will say this is not a time to grandstand and give a long talk. Yes, we have periodic We have time. cookies to eat. Yes, there, there are <laughs> really good I have my priorities in place, yeah. <laughs> For those who are in the in the Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation, that name is is absolutely tied officially to the that's that's their acronym for the report on the religious freedom of America, however long that title was. Yeah, if you if you um, Google or you're looking through your uh, news uh, outlet of choice and search for Project Blitz, that will definitely pull up all of these. Um. The courts have saved our butts over and over again in this country, and I just like to point Can't out, hold. get your reaction to the, uh, about the movement uh, to add justices to the Supreme Court today, and also to do away with the electoral college. Today we have five alleged conservative Cowdham votes on the Supreme Court. Yeah. Four of those five were put there by presidents who came in second. Right. In right. I'm not a big fan of the Electoral College. Uh, I think there are probably better ways that, you know, that we could um, go about making sure that our elections are fair. Um, and there are several ways that, you know, to go about doing that. We need to get money out of politics, you know. Uh, all these organizations are buying elections. Um, but when you talk about the courts, there's, there is a conversation happening about court packing, do we say, okay, instead of nine, let's do 12, let's do, let's bump the numbers up a little bit, 13. I don't think I like the idea of setting that precedent. Once we kick that door open, then, you know, d d does the next president to come along add some more and make it their own? And what sort of limits do we place on that? I think there's a lot more planning and thought that would have to go into that before I'm ready to sign on to it, at least. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for coming to talk with us today. Um, I noticed when you showed the chart, that graph showing the f their funding and their expenditures, 
Um, I noticed there was a dramatic jump between 2012 and 2013. Mm -hmm. um, as a member of the LGBTQ community myself, I, you know, I think of 2012 as the year, as kind of the tipping point, the first time marriage equality won at the ballot box yeah. in four different states, I believe. Um, do you think there's a connection between that and the fact that the funding jumps so dramatically the next oh, year? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when I look at sort of the American political landscape, um, I think of, I try to think of it in sort of an evolutionary term, right? Uh, in that you have a couple of different groups at opposite ends of the spectrum and there we tend to seem to be moving further and further away from each other. But what I think happened here was we had eight glorious years in the White House where we got some good stuff done. But for a lot of people, what we did was we ran the ball way too far down the field, way too fast. And so there is maybe an equal and opposite reaction to all things. I don't know. But what happens, I think, when we try to move society too fast is that there's a group on the other end going, whoa, slow down right? It's, the, it's the, the people who saw rustling in the bush, and I see rustling in the bush, and I go, it's just the wind, nothing to worry about. There's good berries in that bush. Let's go get some berries. There's always somebody on the other side going, hold on, that might be a bear. It might eat us. <laughs> so I think what we see is we have uh, sort of these opposite forces working against each other, and that's not to say that we should take social advancements slowly, I think it's to say that we need to have that in the back of our mind that, that for every action we take forward, there's going to be some sort of reaction on the back end and try to figure out what that might be ahead of time, predict the future and plan for it, if that helps, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all for having me today. It's been a privilege and an honor.